Hi. Um, I'm here to talk about the big U, the microbiome U. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about me, because why not? So I am a bioinformatician. I've been a bioinformatician for 20 years. And in this time, believe it or not, I was never asked what bioinformatics is. You better not believe it, because I was asked all the time. So what is bioinformatics? I came up with a really cool answer. Uh, it's computational modeling of experimental biological data. And I walked around with that definition for about three years or so. And then a friend of mine came and said, well, now we know if Terminator comes back, that's your fault. And um, I, I was very surprised, but then I thought about it. I was like, okay, maybe I need to define what I do this for. And so now my definition is, computational modeling of biological systems so that we can understand disease better or that we can clean up the earth better or now that I started studying the origin of life so that we can understand where we come from better. And that seems to work. But I guess my point here wasn't to actually tell you what bioinformatics is about. You could have looked that up. My point was to say that a comment from a single friend in my community uh, was enough to make me change the things that I did. And this has been a thread in my life, and I guess from the previous speaker, you guys have figured out that community has been a thread in many people's lives. And, um, you know, what, what that means is that things happened in my life because my community influenced it. So, for instance, the reason I became a bioinformatician was because my friends in college said that people who do biology, which is what I was doing at that time, simply don't know how to do math. So I had to prove them wrong, and I did bioinformatics. <laughs> the reason why I'm on stage here today is because my lab sitting over there decided it was a good idea for me to come out and talk on stage. So hey, here I am. So uh, community is, is really a, a big thing in my life and many people's life. But the community I'm going to talk about here is going to be a little smaller. I'm going to talk about your microbes, and uh, I'm going to start from the beginning. So um, this is a rendering of Earth as it would have been 4.4 billion years back. So Earth coalesced 4.6 billion years back. Uh, it was a shooting range in, this, in our solar system. There was chunks of rock and ice flying around, so it wasn't a pretty sight. But at some point, Earth got a moon, we got a magnetic field, we got some water, then 4.4 billion years ago, oceans formed. And they didn't just form randomly, they uh, had to reboil and come back, reform, reboil, and reform again. So eventually we got Earth, uh, we got oceans, and uh, then life formed. Easy, right? But who here re recognizes what uh, a billion years is? It's a really big number. Um, we don't usually think in billions unless we're imagining some money coming in. But um, billion years is a huge number. Um, if you are in college and you're about to graduate or you're going to be about to graduate, if you're 21 years old, you have lived on this planet half a billion seconds. Half a billion seconds. In 4.4 billion years, evolution would have come up with a lot of really cool things. We know that we have direct evidence of the fact that Earth life existed 3.5 billion years ago. Uh, we can model this and say it existed 3.9 billion years ago, or even more than that. Um, whatever came into being when life came into being for the first time would have had to survive pretty damning environment. It was hot. Uh, the next meteorite could wipe out everything. There was no food. Um, and if that sounds like a really great video game plot to you, then I guess we do connect with the cells that appeared back then. So life came onto this planet, and then it changed Earth, and Earth became this. And this is the uh, planet that we like to look at. This is the blue marble that was, a, it's a new edition of the blue marble. This picture was taken in 2015 as opposed to 1972, but it's the same Earth. So what happened was that life appeared. Now, for the first 80% uh, percent of the history of the Earth, for the first 3.5 billion years, there was no oxygen on this planet. And then uh, oxygen appeared, and basically because it is so toxic, wiped out everything that lived on Earth at that point. But it also opened this broad new um, place for life that we know today. 
So oxygen actually started accumulating about 80, 850 million years back was the invention of photosynthesis. And life had grown and diversified and gave us this beautiful image. So uh, I talk about diversity. Most of the diversity on Earth actually hangs out in the ocean. That's uh, 10 to the power of 28 bacterial cells hanging out in the ocean. It's a really large number. That's about 100 million times more than the number of stars in the known universe. So there's a lot of diversity, uh, but there's also diversity on, on land. Just a fun fact, the number of bacteria in a teaspoon of soil is roughly the same as the number of people in Africa. Um, there is also bacteria that are in your gut, and there is a lot of them. In fact, there is trillions of them, and trillions is 10 to the power of 12, just sort of uh, keeping you on track with the numbers. So what are they doing in their gut? Well, they're a community, and there are other forms of communities. So one of the smallest communities that you can imagine is the cell. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but there are little blue specks all over this cell, and those blue specks are mitochondria. Mitochondria used to be free-living bacteria that decided it would be a good idea to move into a big bacteria for protection. And now, they are the batteries of our cells. Our cells cannot survive without them, and they cannot survive without us, but they used to be separate organisms. Um, so this is a community, although it's at this point an obligate community, that is, we cannot live without each other. Um, the next level of community, another level, is called multicellularity. And I'm sure you know uh, that, that you are a bunch of cells, right? Everybody wakes up in the morning thinking, I'm a bunch of cells, I'm a community. And uh, so these, uh, this community is actually quite interesting because you all, have, all of your cells have the same genome, but they have diversified them to perform different functions. So your muscle cells, for instance, hide the pieces of the genome that's necessary for anything other than uh, muscle function. So they only perform muscle function. So do your skin cells. So now if you think about that, you're a community of communities of your cells that are communities of mitochondria and other cells, right? So it's a community of communities of communities. And then, as I told you, there is bacteria living on you. So, you know, make things worse, community to the power of four. Um, and of course, the one thing that I'd like you to think about is when you go out into the world, you're not alone. It's not just people out there, it's also plants and animals, and they are also your community. And they're going to make your life easy, and there is probably no way you can survive without them. So this is a message for this talk, and please keep that in mind. So uh, I told you about bacteria living on your body. Your gut is the most diverse bacterially part of your body. So we're just gonna focus on that. Um, there are roughly 10 times more bacteria living on you than you have human cells. So if you walk out of here thinking you're human, think about it again. Okay. So uh, bacteria on different body parts actually differ quite drastically, and I'm going to talk about this later, but bacteria are good for you. In fact, that the fact that, uh, that your bacteria are good for you has actually been noticed in very early on, in 1908, Ilya Mechenkov, a uh, Russian zoologist, had actually started the first probiotics craze, saying that if you drink the Bulgarian bacillus, I think that's a lactobacillus subspecies that you can have in yogurt, but if you drink the Bulgarian bacillus in the morning, you will prevent the frailty and senility of old age. All right, so he was you know, set on this particular bacterium. He was very interested in that. Unfortunately, very soon after, we discovered antibiotics. And antibiotics basically turned every single bacterium into a bad thing, right? So we're going to wipe them out. And this is a really bad thing for the good bacteria on you. So your bacteria are actually quite important to you. They are the ones that protect you against the bad bacteria. They don't do it for you, but they do it because they want to live on you. They want access to your body space and your nutrients, and the bad bacteria want that too, so they fight each other out, right? And so before your immune system even sees the bad bacteria, the good ones have, you know, basically taken most of those out. And on the other hand, they are able to generate a whole bunch of molecules that you cannot. 
you cannot generate and you cannot eat. So actually 10% of the molecules in your bloodstream that are really necessary for you to feel well are produced by your bacteria. So they're super important, don't kill them. Um, in fact, there is 20,000 genes that you have in your genome, right? And that's roughly about 14, 11 to 14,000 functions that your genome can carry out. Now, there is, as I said before, trillions of bacteria hanging out on you. So they can figure out a lot more functions than you can, right? So they are giving you a lot more abilities than you actually had. Now, as I mentioned before, the bacterial abilities differ by the site where they live. So they're going to differ between your mouth and your gut and your skin and, um, and uh, your urogenital system. And so the idea is that uh, the bacteria in your mouth have to be very much okay with the fact that you breathe oxygen and once in a while like to have coffee. So this variation in temperature and the oxygen has to be okay with them. On the other hand, the bacteria in your gut are spoiled. They can kind of assume that your temperature isn't going to fluctuate very wildly, right? And uh, actually, there is no oxygen in your gut. So the difference between your bacteria in your mouth and the bacteria in your gut is quite drastic. One study that was done fairly recently, the Human Microbiome Project, had shown, in fact, that my bacteria on the skin is actually a lot closer to your bacteria on the skin than my bacteria on the skin to my bacteria in my mouth, okay? So actually, your genome is the same throughout, but bacteria vary very much. And this is important because that means that the bacteria a couple of feet away between my mouth and my gut vary more than bacteria in the ocean 100 miles apart. And this is something really interesting to keep in mind. So what we wanted to do as a lab is figure out if this actually applies not only to the environment, so different body sites, but also to the individual bacteria. And so we went to and looked at the bacteria. Here, the colors represent where the bacteria comes from. And the, the proximity in the slide actually says how similar are the bacteria. And if anyone sees a color pattern here, you're a much better artist than I am there really isn't any color pattern. So uh, what you're seeing is that for individual bacteria, it really doesn't matter where they are. So to draw a metaphor, you could build any house from the same bacterial bricks, but the houses are going to look different depending on the environment or country that they are in. So for instance, Japanese homes are going to be very different from German ones, right? And so then we added to this picture the non-human bacteria, and I specifically want to point out the marine ones and the hydrothermal event ones that are highlighted by this oval over there. And what the addition of those bacteria did is actually push the human bacteria closer together uh, because, you know, in contrast to an igloo built out of ice blocks, Japanese and German homes are the same thing. Okay, so what does this mean? If we actually go back to looking at microbiomes rather than individual bacteria, we see that microbiomes group closer together that are human, and the non-human uh, microbiomes group, group away. So I, I want to uh, give a shout out to the New York City subway microbiome up here. That's the, the one that's uh, kind of a poopy color, right, up and up. <laughs> that um, does not look like your skin microbiome right? And actually doesn't even look like a gastrointestinal or fecal microbiome, right? Uh, it looks very different. Actually kind of looks like the sand beach, uh, the beach sand from the Gulf of Mexico a little bit. That's the yellow stuff. And the Arctic snow, that's the, the gray stuff, but not like you. So if you ever took the subway and wondered how many of the bacteria are actually migrating from your skin onto the handle and then from the handle onto somebody else's skin? The answer is not many. Okay, so no, no comment on pathogenicity though, so you may be picking up something that's pretty bad for you anyway. <laughs> anyway, to, to, to proceed from this uh, point, I think that my, my main message here is that bacteria, which you didn't see grouping by color before, 
is very different from microbiomes, which you do see grouping by color before. That means that as part of a community, you as a bacteria, as part of a community, are able to live in significantly more places than you can on your own. And that's a big deal because that also applies to us. As part of a community, we can do a lot more than on our own. So um, the big U, what is the big U? Can you walk around and actually exchange your bacteria with everybody? Probably that not via New York City subway handles. Um, and also these bacteria that are living on you don't really contribute to you as an organism a homo sapiens, right? So you're not an individual organism with all of these bacteria, one thing. They are separate bacteria, you are separate. But you, you right there, you sitting here, not in a distinct biological sense, but you here, are very much dependent on your bacteria. Uh, there are three things that define a person. Well, there are more, but three things biologically that define a person. One is your genome, obviously. Um, another one is your immunity that is actually built via exposure to all of kind of bacteria that you have out there, uh, the bad bacteria in this case. And the third one is your thinking, your brain. And actually, your microbiome very, very clearly affects all three of these. So first of all, your genome selects for which bacteria can live on you. That's clear. Your immune system very early on learns to recognize the bacteria that are good for you as self. So if that's a definition, your bacteria are part of you as self, right? And then the third one you're thinking, this is the most, the hardest one. We know for a fact that bacteria actually have an effect on neurodegenerative disease or contribute to neurodegenerative disease, but also it seems that they change our ways of thinking. So they, they alter the signaling to the brain, and I don't just mean just because you're hungry, you're going to be really mad, okay? So uh, bacteria are you. They are part of you. They are you. And this is something to think about going forward. Um, the, the theme of this uh, conference is the pale blue dot. I don't like thinking about the pale blue dot. I like thinking about this beautiful blue marble a little bit closer up. And for reference sake, in terms of surface area, the Earth is 100 times bigger than us than we are than the microbes. So actually, we're really tiny as compared to the Earth. And there are much fewer of us than there are microbes on us. But our impact is huge. It's outsize. Uh, we are doing things which are the equivalent of oxygenating the planet. That is, we're killing everything in our sight. And remember that this is not a good thing. Remember that you cannot be away from your community. Your community needs you, and you need it. So take care of this blue dot, blue marble. It's up to you.